Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to this uh, CBCS uh, seminar series. And to be honest, I think that I should be honored because I didn't expect so many people here yeah. during Easter because I get all I forwarded the uh, email to several other people and all got, oh, I'm on holiday, I'm on break, I leave, whatever. <laughs> email me on the 17th. But um, welcome, uh, Derek, to, uh, to, to be here and give a uh, presentation. Uh, Derek is in charge of NOAA Coral Reef Watch. And you can see it on the screen already. It's an image that I'm very familiar with and will hope everybody else doing work on reefs definitely is familiar with. Um, Derek did a PhD at, uh, in Miami at the Rosential School on coral reef um, climate change. And climate change. Yeah. And uh, in 2001, <laughs> uh, he started at NOAA. In 2021, he took over uh, the lead role of uh, NOAA Coral Reef Watch. And welcome to Give Talk. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I'm very grateful to give this uh, talk to you all. Um, so Coral Reef Watch actually started in 1997. And what really put it on the map was uh, Coral Reef Watch was able to predict bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef in 1998. And uh, as they say, the rest is really history. Um, so Coral Reef Watch has been engaging managers, scientists, the public, uh, and the media now for about three decades. So as many of you are probably aware, corals live very close to their upper thermal limits. So all it takes is about uh, sea temperature deviation as little as one to two degrees Celsius during the warmest part of the year. If that's sustained for about a month or more, you get bleaching, which is a, a breakdown in symbiosis between the coral animal hosts and the uh, symbiotic algae that live in the gastrodermal tissues. So corals, it's not automatically a death sentence that they bleach. Uh, they can recover if the heat stress subsides uh, quickly enough, uh, but corals that do recover will oftentimes be, have essentially a hangover, will they have uh, decreased reproductive output, slower growth, and be more susceptible to disease for about two to four years, at least after they recover from bleaching. So the coral symbionts, uh, the algal, algal symbionts provide uh, upwards of about 95% of the uh, nutritional requirements to the coral animal. So when a coral is bleached, it's uh, effectively slowly starving. So the main question that's on my mind is what are coral reefs gonna look like in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Um, so to try to answer that question, I want to take you to the other side of the Pacific Ocean, to the eastern tropical Pacific. Now, the eastern tropical Pacific uh, has very marginal reefs. You're really at the environmental limits of what corals are able to withstand. Um, but what's really beneficial about these reefs is that they've been studied since about the mid-1970s. So we have a very long-term data set going back in time looking at these reefs. Uh, so these are very low diversity reefs. There's really only two genera of corals uh, that uh, build reefs in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Uh, we used to think these were monospecific, uh, but it turns out if you look at the genetics, there's probably uh, a couple different species of massive varieties that are able to build reefs. And then uh, primarily what was thought of as post operative for us. So believe it or not, it's been 40 years since the first large scale regional mass coral bleaching event. So this took place in the Eastern Tropical Pacific uh, during the 1982-83 El Nino. Um, so these are sea temperature records. This is from Panama, from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute of now Islands. This is the, the Galapagos from the uh, Charles Darwin Foundation. So the squiggly line is uh, daily average temperatures from uh, 1982 to 1983. The solid line is the seasonal cycle, which is a kind of a, a nice name of basically saying average conditions for that time of the year. So what you'll notice in Panama, we have this thermal thermal anomaly of about a degree Celsius during the warmest part of the year, whereas in Galapagos, the thermal anomaly is much greater. So it's about two to three degrees Celsius for months on end. Um, and this image over here on the left, excuse me, oops. This just shows you the, the sum of the thermal anomalies during the 82, 83, 97, 98 El Nino. And the, the point I want to emphasize there is that there's really a gradient of heat stress as you go from the Galapagos to Canada. Um, so the Eastern Tropical Pacific is really the strongest upwelling environment anywhere in the oceans. Um, 
you probably know about thermal haline circulation where waters seep in the or sink in the North Atlantic, kind of travel along the bottom of the ocean. And the eastern tropical Pacific is where a lot of these waters are upwelled. Um, and that's one of the main reasons uh, coral reef development is so marginal in this location. And very few species are able to tolerate the conditions and really survive. That uh, you're gonna have to click that. I can't get rid of it on the screen. The way up, black bottoms. Thanks. So there's really been three kind of different responses in the eastern tropical Pacific to the 1982-83 El Nino warming event. So the best case scenario is what was observed in Panama. So Panama experienced the lowest regional heat stress. So. Over the three episodes that have occurred, three major El Nino that have occurred, Panama's over only ever really experienced five to 10 degree heat weeks. So one degree heating week is when you get a thermal anomaly that's one degree Celsius greater than the maximum monthly sea surface temperature for that site. So in essence, you take the maximum, or excuse me, you take the average of sea surface temperature during the warmest month of the year. You add one degree Celsius to that, that's the bleaching threshold. So four degree heating weeks is equivalent to temperatures being a degree above the maximum monthly mean sea surface temperature for about a month. So in essence, five to 10 degree heating weeks would be a one degree thermal anomaly for five to 10 weeks. So during the 1982-83 El Nino, uh, about 75 to 85% of the corals in Panama died. And a max degree heating week then was about 7.6. However, there was enough survival in the uh, main reef building coral in Panama, which is post opera. So, what you see here in the image, as you can tell, it's basically a mono specific buildup of corals, but they do create pretty significant reef structures in Panama. Um, so, by about 2002, 2003, the reef had actually recovered the coral cover that it had prior to the 8283 element. And what's been observed is that the survival of coastal opera is associated with uh, coral associating with heat tolerant uh, symbionts. So, uristinium glenide is the uh, heat tolerant symbiont in Panama. And the corals that associate with uristinium glen glenide experience less bleaching, less mortality, and they appear to uh, be more resilient to the bleaching stress. So the hypothesis is that there was differential survival during the 82 83 El Nino that's selected for these corals that were able to associate with these heat-tolerant symbionts. And then over time, these guys essentially regrew the reef. However, there has been notable declines in the other reef building species uh, of coral in Panama. So the other main species, now to give you an idea, it's a very low species diversity. So in any given region, you're only looking at about 20 to 25 coral species. So it's very different from what you see here in the third region. Uh, so the other species that occur in Panama have not shown any increased tolerance uh, to thermal stress. So they've been impacted about the same each um, on the U of it. And there's also been uh, local extinctions at the same place. And two of the molecular fire corals in Panama have gone extinct. So the worst case scenario is what happened in the Galapagos. So at about mid-1975, a guy by the name Jerry Wellington was working with the Peace Corps. He was snorkeling around Galapagos and he started seeing corals and coral buildups at certain locations. So a buddy of his, a man by the name of Peter Glenn, who was my PhD advisor, went down and started documenting these reefs in the mid-1970s to the 80s. Now, prior to this, it was believed that there were no coral reefs in the Galapagos Islands. Even Darwin commented on the, the absence, the conspicuous absence of coral reefs in essentially the entire eastern tropical Pacific. Um, but it turns out there are very there was very small coral reef uh, coral reefs developed in these in uh, the Galapagos. Um, now, the mean framework thickness at all the coastal opera reefs was only about 1.1 meters. So these reefs are only about 500 to 1,000 years old. And you can see again, very uh, typical monospecific buildup of coastal operative corals here in Devil's Crown. And ironically, when the uh, book was published documenting these reefs was 1983, which is when 
they all died. Uh, so Devil's Crown Galapagos has seen no recovery since this event. About 95 to 99% of all the corals died associated with the 82, 83 El Nino. And the reef itself was actually bioeroded in about 10 years' time. Now, we often hear statements like loss of coral reefs. But what makes this example unique is that the entire reef framework was completely eroded and gone. So what you're looking at here is essentially the basement basalt. Um, and, you know, here's some basically some dead varieties um, that are still there. So no recovery. Uh, I think it's pretty intuitive when you look at an image like this that the biodiversity that depends on the three-dimensional structure of coral reefs is essentially gone. So lessons from the Eastern Pacific. Well, the obvious one, obvious one is the response of coral reefs to warming is a function of the magnitude and the duration of the thermal anomaly. So we have a very good recipe for how to wipe coral reefs off the map. And that's essentially two to three degrees Celsius of warming. And another interesting facet about the Eastern Tropical Pacific is because it's an upwelling environment, uh, upwell waters are enriched in CO2, so they have low pH and higher nutrients. So you essentially create a model for what the uh, tropical surface ocean is going to look like with two to three times atmospheric CO2. So two to three degrees of warming plus uh, two to three X CO2 world, or we just go bye bye. In Panama, we've seen survival of coastal offering, enough so that they regain re, uh, the previous uh, coral cover and, and maintain reef accretion. Uh, and the uh, survival of coastal opera appears to be associated with uh, heat tolerant algal symbionts. However, big caveat on this this mechanism may become ineffective once these reefs start experiencing more heat stress. Because as of right now, they've only really ever topped out at about 90 degree heating weeks. So they haven't experienced what the Galapagos has experienced. So it's hard to say at this point if during the next El Nino, which is developing now, if it's stronger than these previous three, you know, it remains to be seen if these uh, corals are going to be, be able to survive that. Massive parietes has been able to survive in all locations. So massive parietes occurs from Ecuador through the Pacific all the way to the coast of Kenya. So it's very well distributed, very heat tolerant coral in general. Uh, it's generally one of the latter corals to bleach there during a thermal stress event. And it, usually is able to recover. Um, and one of the reasons uh, it's thought that's possible is they're actually able to retract their tissues into the skeleton. Uh, so they're called uh, perforate coral, I believe this term. So there is still one reef in the Galapagos. It's in the far Northern Galapagos Islands, um, incredibly different, difficult place to get to and study. This is a Monogeneric reef. So it's massive varieties, probably two to three species of varieties, varieties of bottom, varieties of um, and then probably varieties of tia. Uh, this uh, creates a very thick framework. So you have framework uh, that's about three meters in height or so. You can see there's quite a few fish in this location. That's because it's so far away, it doesn't really get fished. Um, and that compares to the varieties that has survived in southern islands. So what you'll see here is these parietes uh, are basically, it's what you would call a coral community. They're not really accumulating any coral reef framework. It's just isolated colonies. Um, and we went out and we cored corals from both these locations uh, in 2012. Uh, and what we found is that the extension rates in these two locations are actually identical. The big difference is the skeletal density of these corals in Southern Galapagos are the lowest skeletal density that's ever been documented for massive varieties. So if you look into the, the wealth of literature on massive varieties that's been published, these guys have the, uh, the lowest skeletal density of any massive varieties anywhere in the world. So that's likely contributing to their inability to accumulate any uh, appreciable reef structure. So an interesting facet of this is that the resilient reefs in Galapagos occurs where upwelling is the least as opposed to where it's the greatest. So one of the kind of dogmas in the, in the field of coral reef science is that upwelling environments might provide a thermal refuge to coral reefs with warming because you get cold pulses of water, 
it might help them survive during uh, bleaching events. A uh, big caveat on that is that I think those kind of statements require in water verification because corals don't like upwelling, high nutrients, low pH, colder water. It's really shocking to, to corals and it really favors different types of communities. So it favors algal growth and also heterotrophic feeders. So one of the things you see in these strong upwelling environments is corals are directly competing in things like barnacles and uh, fermented gastropods and things like that. So filter feeders. So why is Coral Reef Watch needed? Well, it's pretty widely accepted at this point that coral bleaching motion warming is the biggest threat um, for the continuing existence of coral reefs. Uh, so managers, scientists, and the public need to know when and where heat stress is occurring and mass bleaching may happen. Uh, that way they can use this information to inform their monitoring any restoration activities and to manage any local activities. Um, so in Thailand, Vietnam, they've actually closed certain locations to scuba diving because uh, during times of bleaching to try to reduce the contaminant impacts uh, to those sites. This is just a friendly little reminder that corals are not the only thing that bleach. Uh, anemones, many anemones also have symbiotic algae. So when Nemo's anemone bleaches and dies, he no longer has a home. He's probably going to get uh, eaten up pretty quick. So the bottom line at Coral Reef Watch is we want to provide the public managers and scientists with information uh, pertaining to when their reefs are at risk of use uh, for bleaching. So at Coral Reef Watch, we develop our own sea surface temperature product called Coral Temp. And this uh, blends together uh, satellite sea surface temperature data from geostationary satellites and polar orbiting satellites. There we go. So we're primarily interested in the uh, temperature anomalies. So we produce a sea surface temperature anomaly product. This, this essentially shows you how ocean temperatures compare at any given time to average conditions at that site. So the anomalies we're most interested in for corals are what you call hotspots. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for coral bleaching, we're mainly interested in the deviation of temperatures above that maximum monthly sea surface temperature. So a hotspot is uh, how warm it is greater than that maximum monthly sea surface temperature. So again, any hotspots that are greater than or equal to one degree Celsius greater than that max monthly SST get summed over the past 12 weeks. And this yields the degree heating weeks metric, which is a very good predictor of uh, coral bleaching in the field. So anytime you hit four degree heating weeks, we expect bleaching to start occurring, mass bleaching, so reef-wide bleaching. Uh, when you hit eight degree heating weeks, that's when we expect mortality to uh, start occurring. And uh, fun fact, uh, the data that went into coming up with those thresholds is actually derived from lab experiments that were done in Panama at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute by my PhD advisor, uh, looking uh, at these corals responded to heat stress. So that the Eastern Tropical Pacific has really generated a lot of knowledge um, for how reefs are going to respond to climate change. And then uh, Gong Lu, who's a senior scientist at Coral Reef Watch, developed what is called the bleaching alert area. So this is kind of the simplified version of the product. Uh, what this means in essence is anywhere in red is where you uh, anticipate bleaching level heat stress uh, to have occurred over the past seven days. And then we also have regional virtual stations. And what that is, is essentially all the coral reef watch products summarized for a particular region. So we also produce a four month coral bleaching outlook. Uh, so this answers the question, will my reef be at risk for bleaching soon? Uh, so this is the outlook as of March 21st. And you can see uh, with El Nino coming, it's predicting potential thermal stress for the equator in the Eastern Pacific, which is what you expect. It's during El Nino, trade winds will relax, kind of switch, turn the other way, shuts off the upwelling in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, thermocline uh, deepens, and you get anomalously warm water uh, throughout the Pacific, Central Pacific, Eastern Pacific. So I now want to walk you through our regional virtual stations. So we have 214 regional virtual stations, um, and I want to focus in on Fiji because that uh, just Bleach and is in the process of recovery right now. So if you go to the website, there's a Google Earth interface. 
you see all these little icons, you click on one, so Fiji pops up, and there's two little links you can click on for the uh, alert gauges in Outlook or the time series data and graphs. So if you click on that, you get an image like this pop up. So this is the uh, data from the Fiji Regional Virtual Station from February 2nd of 2023. And the reason I pulled that up, that's when we received our first in-water observations of bleaching occurring um, in Fiji. So we've now had three independent verifications that bleaching and mortality of a crop row and post slopper is occurring uh, at some locations. Um, so this is the, the data from February 2nd. It shows uh, bleaching level heat stress, uh, mainly in the Lao Island area of Fiji. Um, and then this is the uh, outlook product for weeks one through four, weeks five through eight, weeks nine through 12. So I predicted uh, from that time forward that all of Fiji would essentially uh, experience an alert level two uh, bleaching. So over here, this is the time series data. Uh, dark blue line is daily average sea surface temperature for Fiji. And down here are the integrated degree heating weeks. Um, and you can see that sure enough, the uh, regional virtual station for Fiji <clears throat> exceeded uh, eight degree heating weeks. So mortality is expected. So down here, this is summarized the uh, all the sea surface temperature data for this site, and you'll see the, the black line shows you conditions uh, for this past year. So this past year was one of the warmest years on record uh, for Fiji. So we also produce uh, other satellite model-based decision uh, support products. Uh, we produce a marine heat wave watch, uh, coral disease risk product for Hawaii, light stress damage product. Uh, it's actually going to be turned back on here in the next few years. Uh, so this is important because the response, the bleaching response is really due to the interaction of high temperatures with high light uh, and damage to photosystem too. So uh, what we hope to do with the light stress damage product is to refine our bleaching predictions to make them better for areas that might not behave perfectly with the uh, dewy heating weeks uh, bleaching thresholds. We do ocean color monitoring in Puerto Rico and Hawaii. We also produce thermal history metrics, uh, which I think will be important for the Philippine project. Um, this shows you uh, how much thermal stress any particular regions experienced. And then finally, we have larval connectivity models for Florida and Hawaii. So to the top there, we just experienced our uh, third global coral bleaching event. Uh, that started in 2014 in the Marianas Islands in Florida, and then proceeded throughout the global oceans over the next three years. So this was the longest global bleaching event ever recorded and the most damaging ever recorded. So more than 75% of all reef areas around the globe experienced bleaching level heat stress, and more than 50% of the reefs around the globe were exposed, exposed to bleaching level heat stress uh, two to three times. So this is uh, currently in revision, being left by being led by my predecessor, uh, Mark Aiken. Uh, so hopefully we get this published in the next year or so. So I want to briefly discuss the Great Barrier Reef bleaching that took place uh, just this past year, 2022. Uh, so December 2021, our Outlook product began predicting very high levels of bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef uh, earlier than had ever been, than had ever occurred before. So we decided to do a deeper dive in the data. And what we found was from November 16th to December 14th, the minimum temperatures over that period were greater than the maximum temperatures of the entire satellite record, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. So the highest temperatures that were experienced in the entire record were lower than the minimum temperatures we saw. So we, essentially wrote up a paper and said Great Barrier Reef is likely to bleach. It started the uh, summer with more heat stress than it's ever experienced before. If you're interested in that, I can give you the link to the paper. So 2021-2022, anomalously warm background temperatures led to the sixth confirmed mass coral bleaching event since 1998 for the Great Barrier Reef. This is at least the fourth event in the last seven years. It seems based on our data that there was likely an additional coral bleaching event that happened in 2021 that no one documented because we were all locked down due to COVID. Um, what's concerning about this is we're now starting to flirt dangerously close to annual bleaching, which is really bad news for corals because basically you're 
not allowing them any time to recover. You're just in a chronic state of stress, um, which is likely going to lead to attrition, essentially, of the cords. So the coral reef watch products predicted the event in advance and also predicted the severity uh, during the event. Um, so Neil Canton was kind enough to give us a shout out during one of the press releases saying that the bleaching they observed on the GVR was consistent with our products. And this was the first mass bleaching, first mass bleaching event on the GVR during one year. So one of our big challenges is that if you've ever seen a bleaching event in the field, variability is the name of the game. Uh, so our products do a good job of predicting reef-wide bleaching, but there's always going to be this variance associated with, with that. And this is due to inter- and intraspecific differences in worlds, uh, with some ion types, light, past bleaching history. Um, and this is just an image from the Caribbean that really shows you this very well. Um, so these white corals here, this is uh, Parites asteroides, uh, which is kind of a common stress-tolerant coral in the Caribbean. Uh, so these two genets are completely bleached, whereas these still have a little bit of their pigmentation. You see these corals down here, Sideroastria sidorea, the Pleuria labyrinth forming, still are pretty well pigmented. This coral here is uh, Montastria cavernosa. Uh, that's what we would call partially bleached. Um, so this is a really good example of uh, illustrating the impact of uh, light interacting with high temperatures. So the tops of the colony are bleached, whereas the sides maintain some of their pigmentation that's likely due to the interaction of light exposure being higher at the top of the column. Another thing you see in the Caribbean is that disease increases during bleaching events. So this coral is experiencing black band disease. You can see some of the colonies already died. So that presents a significant challenge in quantifying how much mortality is actually due to the bleaching because you have these other stressors that are coming in and also causing mortality. So we hope to address this by continuing to collaborate with our partners, including uh, the University of Queensland, uh, Australian Institute of Marine Science, uh, and the NOAA National Coral Reef Monitoring Program to really try to tie down the, the range uh, uh, that you see in different uh, coral genera, different species in terms of bleaching prevalence and also mortality. And one way that I think is going to be helpful in doing this is refining our light stress damage product, because I think a lot of the variability you see on the reefs can oftentimes be attributed to the light differences. So our work plan for the next three years, uh, we're going to establish some single pixel virtual stations, uh, sure. priority coral reef areas, uh, so the U.S. reefs, and then we're also going to delve into uh, international locations. Um, and the reason we want to do this is because right now our virtual stations are regional. So it breaks down the GBR and far, far northern GBR, northern GBR, central, southern, um, and basically integrates this very large area. So it's useful to know if the region is, is heating up and bleaching is likely, but if you're studying a very individual particular reef, uh, the data might not actually be that useful to you. So we really want to respond to the manager's needs and the scientist's needs to have these data for individual pixels for where the reefs are. We're also going to develop uh, regional heat stress projections to 2099 based on the CMIP-6 climate models. Uh, so one of the things managers want to know is when is my reef going to experience annual bleaching? Uh, so this is useful for things like restoration and spatial climate planning. Uh, so you can essentially pick areas that are predicted uh, to bleach later for things like restoration, because you don't want to plant a bunch of corals if it's going to start experiencing at a site that's going to start experiencing annual bleaching in, you know, 10 years or something. Also developing a thermal refugia project, product. So this essentially shows you uh, where on the planet uh, there are reefs that have not yet experienced uh, bleaching level heat stress. So we're working with a collaborator at the University of Sao Paulo, who's done some work at uh, Raja Ampat, which appears to be a bleaching resistant site. It's hard to say if it's bleaching resilient because it hasn't bleached. So we're going to re-implement and refine our light stress damage product uh, by including a recovery term for Photosystem 2. So a PhD student of Roberto Iglesias Prieto at Penn State University in the States uh, looked at how long it takes um, the Photosystem 2 to recover once you pull out, once you remove the heat stress from the corals. And interestingly, what they found is that the recovery appears to occur about two times faster than damage. 
Also working on some manuscripts to look at regional rates of warming throughout the globe. And one of the things we're going to do is uh, do, a, do a statistical assessment of how well degree heating weeks actually work. Because there has been a few papers in the literature that criticize the degree heating metric, said it doesn't really work as well uh, as, as we're claiming. But you know, we're really going to dive in and do an agnostic um, interpretation of the data and see if there's any way we can improve our metrics. So in conclusion, Coral Reef Watch has been uh, monitoring heat stress for coral reef stakeholders since 1997. This is a, a very sobering statistic. Since the start of 2022 alone, in the last 15, 16 months, uh, mass bleaching predicted by Coral Reef Watch has been confirmed by in-water observations in Florida, Japan, Fiji, Vanuatu, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Hainan Island, Vietnam, Northwestern Hawaii Islands and the Great Barrier Reef. So the bleaching problem is getting worse, essentially, uh, every year. So we directly engage with our user community and satellite data providers uh, in an effort to validate and calibrate our products and also approve them for uh, individual needs. So I'd like to thank the Coral Reef Watch team. Uh, these are the people that really make me look good. Uh, you do all the nitty gritty hard work behind the scenes. Uh, Gong Lu has been the, the longest tenured member for Reef Watch. Uh, second longest tenured member is William Skirving, who's in the audience. Uh, Jackie Delacour keeps us all online. And Eric Geiger and Blake Spady uh, as well. Um, so thank you very much. Happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thanks, everybody, and also online. Um, for this attempt there, give you a presentation. Um, any questions from your audience online or in the room? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the other comment that I was going to make in T, which this brought back to me uh, in a big way, was the news this past week about the Antarctica overturning, slowing down at twice the rate of the Atlantic um, overturning. I'm just curious, the connection with um, upwelling what are the if upwelling is going to slow down in those areas do you expect that to then be more helpful to the reefs or the like there's a what's how is that how is the slowing down going to affect the stressors on the reefs particularly in the etv but anywhere in an upwelling um so there's that too i mean i think it's a complicated question um so i think a lot of these corals you know, I think they're essentially adapted to the kind of maximum temperatures they normally experience, which could be quite variable because of the El Nino dynamics of these locations. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, if upwelling slows down, you know, during the cooler parts of the year, it'll probably benefit them. And, you know, the corals grow faster, things like that. Um, but again, I think they'd be more at risk for uh, thermal stress during the warm parts of the year, because essentially that's what happens during El Nino. The other one will shut down, the third of line deepens, sea level actually goes up, flooding some of the coastal regions, the block goes. Um, but again, I, you know, I think the devil is really in the details there in terms of what, how it's going to play out. Yeah, look, I was just going back to your um, observation about um, Rajan Butt and this being the sort of, you know, more stable and less. Uh, to changing the slower rate. Uh, did you use any other, you know, with Bayer et al, the paper that I was involved with, uh, we also added things like um, projected changes in, in, in uh, wind stress and, and storms and reef connectivity. And have you tried to, to combine your data with this, those sort of metrics that, so, you, you know, you maybe reduce the bias of Optional pinnacles to those that are most useful in terms of conservation. Yeah, no, we have it. Uh, this is basically a, a product that's, I guess, very early in its development. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a great idea of looking forward. Sure. Try to integrate it with the other data that's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, we're sort of contemplating doing another analysis of those data. So it might be really useful to expand the group of opportunities. Be great. Yeah, yeah, I need to read it out. So, I'm going to read it out. So, I'm going to read it out. 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 I'm going
Oh, look, that was just a comment and then a question. One comment. I was just thinking the, the representative areas rezoning of the reef was obviously uh, achieved before some of the worst coral bleaching occurred subsequently. But I completely agree with your comment about the importance of giving managers credibility. Um, but my question was, um, I think I saw on your CV something about Chagos Archipelago in the Indian Ocean. Um, it's an area of interest to me, and there's this beautiful coral, Tonella Chagos, which is endemic to the area, which got badly damaged in bleaching a few years ago. I just wondered if you might know anything about whether there's, whether we have information on whether there's recovery of that region. I don't know about that particular species, but all the images I showed of um, table cropper corals, those are all from Chagos. So like coincidentally, I just happened to be there when the bleaching started in 2015. Um, so most of those areas did die, yeah. unfortunately. However, recovery is taking place. There's a lot of recruitment. Uh, there's a paper that came out of it last year. Um, so they're seeing a lot of recruits go proper in that. So apparently there's still locations where there's big enough populations to reproduce um, that are healthy enough. Now, in terms of that particular species, I don't know. It's it's a it's a brine coral. It used to be included in the androids, but I think it's been been moved taxonomically. Um, but that was something I could yet only find it uh, in the show was But anyway, I'll see what I can find out. I haven't looked it up, but it would be great if that's recovered. Yeah, I can you know put you in touch with people that probably have an answer. Right. Thanks. Yeah. So um, great talk. I also would like to put a plug in for your temperature data. I work in temperate uh, reefs in the Northwest Atlantic, and we actually use your temperature layers to predict what will happen to our water and our kelp beds. But um, they are actually the most comprehensive at the right scale uh, available. So, that's good. That's really yeah, good. yeah. Um, but I was thinking more about um, the sort of um, uncertainty in your prediction. So I'm assuming that when it's an alert level two uh, over large scales, that's pretty certain that everything's going to bleach more or less. But what happens with those sort of uh, lower alert levels? And how does uncertainty play into your ability to predict um, at, you know, at scales that are relevant, for example, for small scale fishers that live on islands and small islands in the Pacific that need to understand what's going to happen to the resource that they're fishing. And is, how does that, does the uncertainty go down with the alert level or is that something not? So, I mean, my impression is the, the satellite data, you know, the, the scale of mass bleaching when it occurs is that it does a pretty darn good job of telling you when things are hotter than average. And that, I mean, Corals seem to be very responsive to those thresholds, um, which is kind of miraculous when you think about it, because the data that went into the products, well, I mean, it was it was based on you know maybe one experiment, kind of a, like I said, a very marginal environment. I mean, where the experiments were done, it was water from Gulf of Panama right off Panama City, so it's pretty miraculous that the product works that well. Um, so in terms of smaller scale, again, you know, if, if the bulk ocean is hot you're most likely going to have heat on the reefs and it's going to be reflected in bleaching. Um, but in terms of one of the problems in the Florida Keys is you do have uh, thermal variability at scales smaller than the five kilometer products. So we actually have a product now or a project now that's going to deploy in situ temperature buoys at seven of the sites they plan to restore because last year they outplanted a bunch of corals, didn't really consider the environment. They all bleached and die. So they need that information at a smaller scale than what we can provide. So in cases like that, you know, it, you probably really need insight you uh, data to inform kind of these local scale variability. Yep. Um, could higher resolution satellites do more on that? Yes. So we have to. <laughs> Have a proposal in right now um, that William can speak a lot more intelligently, intelligently about. Um, but it, the goal is to develop um, heat stress SST data at 100 meter, 100 meter resolution. So, so I don't know how, <laughs> not higher. 
Oh, this the title I'm with the signal noise on a uh, on a thermal sensor at uh, the sorts of high speed. Yeah. And we're actually using geostationary satellites to do that because you need temporal coverage because it varies so much. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're 36,000 kilometers away, not the 1500 kilometers that you guys fly around that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's that will be quite. Earth shattering is what you pull it off. Mm -hmm. 100, 100. Now it will be daily averages. So, uh, but that should do for a coral because they don't mind if they get a little bit hot, a little bit cold through the through the day. But to divide up the reef into uh, 100 meter chunks will be pretty special. Yeah, so I think some of your talk, you. Um, mentioned the interaction between temperatures and pH and how they can kind of have a compound effect in the middle region. How much of a big deal is that globally in pH? Because there are products that exist to uh, look at pH at a global level and how to talk about integrating that into a course that they now across the forecast. Um so I mean when you're comparing temperature with ocean is with pH, I mean you gotta remember that. Temperature kills corals. Ocean is indication really doesn't, to our knowledge. Um, so, you know, the elephant in the room is temperature. Ocean acidification has a little bit of a secondary impact, uh, but it's definitely something we've thought about. Um, so, there was a product developed for the, the Caribbean and the Atlantic that modeled uh, ocean acidification space. Um, so, I mean, if you go around the world, a lot of the, the oceanic kind of Tropical surface ocean, the carbonate chemistry tends to be pretty similar unless you get in kind of these weird environments where you have local scale modification happening. Like the rock islands in Palau, you basically get local acidification happening due to the respiration of the coral community in a restricted area. Um, and then there's these things like CO2 vents, Papua New Guinea, and also the Marianas. Um, so, I mean, overall, modeling carbonate chemistry, it seems to be. You know, on the open ocean scale, the O might be able to talk about better than I can. It seems to be more consistent um, in the global scale, uh, but it is something we definitely interested in modeling in the future to try to push the product. It's just in that uh, your mention of the alpha dynamics and these specific So it's a very complex. Thing that occurs in the Pacific because the upwell of all the waters potentially fertilize macroalgae and things like that. You get a lot of particulates, you get more heterotrophic feeders. And the other thing that's happening is that it's probably the most important impact of ocean acidification in the Eastern Pacific is its impact on bio erosion. Um, so it's, it's basically stimulating uh, endolithic bio eroders like Osteobium, which is an endolithic alga that's ubiquitous in coral skeletons. Um, and also pleonic sponges get stimulated because all these organisms actually use, uh, they actually secrete organic acids to dissolve coral skeleton and they live inside of them, in essence. Um, so you have really high rates of bio erosion happening in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Um, and again, that's likely due to the interaction of nutrients, temperature. And then you also have the impact on the corals themselves. Um, so you're probably having the corals in the eastern Pacific seem to actually grow a little bit faster than the uh, same ones in the western Pacific. So you're probably probably going to be feeding more on a particular kind of the water. But um, in the Galapagos, in particular, you see strong impacts on the integrity of the skeleton itself. So this is probably an interaction of low pH and high nutrients. So phosphates can act like a crystal poison in coral skeletons. Um, so it's probably an interaction of nutrients. Um, and pH that are really creating kind of this perfect storm, if you will, such that the preservation of the new framework structure is really impacted by this, this interaction of upwelling. Um, yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Hi, Jerry. Thank you. Um, I'm probably just extending already the conversation that's been had about management strategies. And I just wanted to put in the important work 
that citizen science plays within this area and that grassroots, um, as you say, there are not enough eyes on the read it's the, the extent of the read that it actually embracing citizen science grassroots and doing all the stuff that we can to save reefs from harm and I'm wondering if there is a great capacity to work in partnership with citizen science to really galvanate and I know as I've said you know it's, it's the long term and, and as well said you know um, decreasing temperatures is huge we need to really um, get as many people on board as we can and I think citizen science is going to maybe allow us to to have that army yeah, so I mean, one of the big challenges in really documenting fishing impacts is monitoring programs only have limited budgets, right? So in a perfect world, you want pre-bleaching data, good pre-bleaching data, and then you want to be there during the bleaching, and then you want to be there right after the bleaching to tease out that mortality. Because I mean, after after a coral dies, I mean, a couple months, you can't tell. You know, it goes through this successional process. So a dead coral that's four to six months, you're old, you know. Old doesn't really look much different than dead coral that's been dead for years. Um, so I think citizen science is really important in terms of alerting when things are changing, you know, when you get when the bleaching starts. Um, and I think the coral watching program and their bleaching cards are really useful for that fact. Yeah, I think in extension to that is it gives us that context to have that further conversation about climate change to say this is happening, this has happened. Now let's think about what we're doing with this now environmental footprint. That's probably the transition that Carl Watch is making is looking at the impact that we are having our own. Uh, one of the things I, I thought of in regard to your question is so the only place in the Galapagos where there's still a coral reef. Um, it's probably just a spurious correlation, but the aragonite saturation state at that site is actually um, identical to what Ove identified as kind of a critical limit for reef development in his 2007 paper. So an aragonite saturation state of 3.3 in pre-industrial times was really where you draw the line where coral reefs can exist. So it's kind of interesting um, yeah. correlation. Yeah. Having some kind of predictability or understanding of what the age levels are um, could help with management if they're going to do a restoration or some kind of public restoration. You could look at the age levels, I guess you could monitor it for time. You could also forecast it. Actually. Yeah. Okay. The problem is it's, it's very expensive to do. Yes. Right. Um, I want to close off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so people are going up. But I, I want to make one more comment because one thing which I think is sometimes under, underestimated um, is the fact that um, it's open source. It's all for free. Anybody in the world has access to the database, they can look at it. And it's mind blowing that scientists and researchers and managers, the public can look at these data sets and help use that to get an idea. And that's why it's also so valuable. That the American government put so much funding uh, in this to make it happen, uh, and for such a long time. Because that also, there's not many such long time monitoring programs uh, at the global scale that are so efficient. Uh, you know, it's a uh, really good, good thing. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, I think you can email them and pass it out. Um, for now, uh, thank you all for coming.